All right, what's up? Welcome. Long requested. Jamie, uh, unfortunately, didn't feel like being with me tonight. She's a little sore. She had a little bit of a minor poke and surge operation. She had a xenomorph removed from her belly. Just kidding. Uh, she did have a minor surgery. No big deal. She's a little sore so she's good no worries but she was not up to the live stream we thought maybe she would feel like it but not tonight so it's just me boring old me and my uh, new lesbian wine aunt glasses and bonus lesbian aunt hairdo so welcome big big interview today probably uh, actually believe it or not Next to Lord Voldemort, today uh, we I had a long conversation with, uh, I, I don't want to say who yet, but probably the biggest figure that I've talked to, and it was pretty wild. We talked for about an hour and a half, uh, that'll be up in a few weeks, but man, it was crazy. So, and I'm not talking about Tucker, that was cool, um... I didn't actually talk to Tucker when we did that. I was on the documentary, as you guys saw, and um, Tucker introduced it, and he did mention me and whatnot, so that's definitely cool, super awesome, super thankful for all that, but this is a totally different situation. <laughs> this is, this is, uh, this was wild, man, I don't know, it was a, a wild conversation, um, a lot of the research stuff you've heard me talking about a lot of it was pretty much confirmed uh, by this individual particularly particularly in the domains of theories about what happened with Marilyn Monroe what happened with JFK what happened with RFK what happened with um, a lot of those individuals and you know not just that but what about movies and the way that those or uh, events have been portrayed right it was pretty wild so look for that it's going to be crazy you guys are um you guys are going to be surprised Th this was this was not what you are probably expecting so we're branching out doing all kinds of crazy stuff and that's one of the challenges i think of what we do because i was watching these videos that tell you how you're supposed to do it on youtube <laughs> And it's like, oh, you have to corner a niche, corner a niche. But that's the problem is that we don't do it that way. So, no, you're not going to lose brain cells. We don't, I'm not interested, I don't want to corner a niche. I want to talk about all the things I'm interested in, not just one thing, right? So, I'm just giving little leaks and, you know, little teasers Right, that this is the most famous person I've talked to today. It was crazy. I mean, next to Lord Voldemort, right? So, I'm not counting Lord Voldemort because you know we're on there every Friday. We did that what a month ago. We did that whole uh, two hour special, right? Next to Lord Voldemort. I mean, it's just going to blow your it's going to blow your minds. That's what, that's all I'm trying to say. I'm hyping it up because it really will live up to the hype. I couldn't believe we had this conversation. I was blown away, and uh, you know it's just another love, layer and level of vindication that hey, you know you got people who know what they're talking about saying yeah okay you, a lot of what you said sounds good. So there we go. Tonight though. We have never delved into... I don't even know why. I'm not sure why we never got into Matt Dadbod. Because we did a lot of Baffleck over the years. Right? We talked about all the bastard retards. Bastard retarded! And it got so Boston retarded that at one point, Baffleck actually plays a retard assassin. <laughs> when we cover the accountant... And the dang algorithm just didn't like that Baffleck stream. But the Baffleck stream, I promise you, it's really good. That Baffleck stream is worth watching. 
And I don't know what we talked about, why, why the algorithm didn't like it. But, I mean, we, we talked about some cool stuff in there because there was a lot of hints and a lot of little uh, nods and things that are dropped, right, in the Batfleck stream. Particularly the propaganda, for example, around uh, Pearl Harbor, the elements of Batfleck at, when he's an assassin, Right, where they basically just took Jason Bourne, James Bond, and said, let's make him a Spurg 9000. That's what the accountant was. That was wild. Because it's sort of like they're normalizing us and conditioning us. Right. I got a sip and jog. You all know that. I did make a funny little cringe core video where I was singing about, I, put, I filled it up with, with odd brown liquids. And I was sipping it when all it was was like, molasses in there it made it look all weird and brown i got a sipping jug and i'll sip it all night so that's a good freaking cringe core idea there what do you guys think of that if you would hit like and share let's back back to born back to born so i'm thinking uh we got to do this because it's been requested and we've never done it right now I gotta check with some real quick because I never looked to see was Robert Ludlum's background in intelligence. I don't know, but probably because this is one of those things where you know typically we find the people that write these site these types of stories have a background in intelligence work. Not always, but quite often. So uh, is that the case with Robert Ludlum? So it says that he was educated at various universities, academy, blah, 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 drama. Okay, so nothing uh, odd or interesting there. He studied drama, theater. Well, that's interesting. Now, we know that actors and theater people have been oftentimes recruited into intelligence. So um, not much to that. Very possible, but it doesn't look like there's much information. Not a lot on Robert Ludlum. Really, when you go look up his biography, basically just famous for the Bourne movies. Now, they made a, a 80s or like a 1990s Bourne movie. Do you know that? And one of the reasons that we have to um, we have to cover him is that one of the things you'll notice is that the novels do and the, the movies do revolve around conspiracy theories. And it's even mainstream, right? Like, it, it's known that his novels all involved, to some degree, real conspiracies. That's why we're covering it. In fact, Ludlum himself wrote that the Matter East Circle was inspired by the history of the Trilateral Commission. And as you know, we are uh, currently working through the Patrick Wood book, Trilaterals Over Washington, that he wrote a long time ago with Anthony Sutton, because we've covered the other Anthony Sutton books and you guys, uh, I did a poll and you guys mainly said, let's do that next. So that's interesting because apparently Ludlum was aware of Trilateral Commission and this kind of stuff. So again, very odd that you have this theater dude who seems to know about some pretty high level stuff, given that he was writing this novel, which I've not read, in 1979. So 1979, he was writing about the Trilateral Commission. That's crazy. In a book called The Matter East Circle. Now, there's another one, too, that he wrote uh, way ahead of time about uh, T-E-R-R-O-R. -R -R, Terrish. And that was called The Holcroft Covenant in 1978. And that has Michael Caine. There's a movie with Michael Caine. The Holcroft Covenant. Master Wayne. Now, I think that... But that relates to, you know, kind of like standard fare... Uh, little tiny mustache men networks, right? Which is kind of overplayed. There were so many. If you look at movies and novels, spy novels from the 1950s up into the 70s, I mean, there was just so many. Because that you you could make movies about that, right? That's approved. You could make a few uh, thousand <laughs> movies and novels about underground you know, Galen organization networks and all that. So, and that's a real, that is a real thing. It's just kind of like overdone. It's like, come on, it's not, that's not running everything in the world. Uh, that's one element of understanding the 20th century and its conspiracies.
But it is interesting, again, to note that Robert Ludlum of Jason Bourne fame wrote so often about conspiracy theories, and it notes that, for example, rather than being being isolated bands of uh, ideological or politically motivated extremists, typically in Ludlum stories, the individuals are pawns of giant government private organization groups that are uh, intent on establishing an authoritarian super state. So we do have reference to basically the NWO. And there's a ton of these. I mean, there's like a freaking zillion of these. Now, I'm not covering tonight the the uh, 2016 Matt Dadbot installment because it was not that good. It was kind of boring. Uh, so we're only covering the first four. I did still kind of like the J- the Jeremy Renner uh, episode. That one was pretty good. And uh, we're going to get to the details and how I think that throughout the Bourne movies, we actually have references to quite a few real things. So we're doing a classic esoteric Hollywood type of thing tonight. And uh, I'll be showing you a lot of the books that I think identify these real programs and um, today, obviously, because you guys, as you guys know, the real documents of MK Ultra are pretty sparse in the sense of we only have some of those. But there's a lot of authors, a lot of people have written on this, and uh, we've lectured through at least one, two, three, three or four of the main texts in uh, on my channel. So you guys should be familiar with that. But uh, back to born let's get to the main issue here if you guys would hit like and share shout out on a nice uh balmy tuesday night every night's balmy i I just always say it's balmy it could be two degrees outside it's a balmy two degrees tonight it is actually warm and uh thank god for that so sick of all the cold we got a nice 320 people welcome everybody all you chat nerds hit like and share so I remember at the time watching uh, when this game <coughs> came out and it was like, okay, they're going to introduce a new uh, spy franchise, right? We all know about James Bond. Um, we all know about Tom Coombe. He's got Mission Impossible. Well, old Matt Dadbod, he needs uh get him a dang spy thriller franchise. And it worked. So he got a, he had a successful one. I think when you get to that level, right, you want to, you want a franchise, because that's what's going to, you know, be the big bucks. So, Born Identity came out in 2002. This is significant for the date. So, we're one year after the Big Nine event. And you will notice, as many films during that time period illustrated, it was actually a pretty hot-button topic at that time to talk about and critique the uh, Bush expansionist agendas. It was pretty standard to be anti-war uh, throughout Hollywood. Uh, plenty of people in journalists and media were critical and anti-war at that time. And so this was when there was this kind of rational approach still existing amongst what people thought was the left at that time. Okay. Or, or people who thought they were left, right? And, and you, you did begin to have, right after the Big Nine event, some of the earliest questioners of the Big Nine event. So it's very interesting that this came out at the time when there was the beginning swell of the major criticisms of the Big Nine event. And we're also right at prior to and at the beginning of, uh, you know, the expansion into the Middle East, right? Oh, we got to go get, uh, you know, Afghanistan. We got to invade. We got to do this and that because of the Big Nine event. Now, as you guys know, we've covered James Bond ad nauseum. I'm not going to talk about Bond too much, but do remember that Bond is a uh, trained assassin. That is the actual job of Bond. He's not just a spy. He's not just doing surveillance. He's not just, you know, saving Western civilization by, uh, as an old white man, finally going to his death in No Time to Die. <laughs> that was the symbolism of that, right? He's also a trained assassin, and that's actually what the double O status means. All right, he gets his double O status because he's trained in all the arts and uh, uh, techniques of assassinating. Uh, and this is based, as we know, on various figures that 
uh, Ian Fleming himself knew in real life, as well as some of the things that, that Ian Fleming had been involved in. So in this case, though, the focus is much more on um, the trained assassin program. So there's rumors about this, and I think there is truth to that, right? I mean, we don't have all of what the MKUltra programs were, but it does seem pretty obvious that, yeah, certainly they would have been involved in uh, programs to create assassins, sure. And one of the reasons they would be involved in that was not just the, the stories that we have from Dr. Estabrooks about the trigger code with the hidden information and the altars and being able to bring it forth with the keywords, right? That was one of the first things that was published by Dr. Esther Brooks on uh, MPDDID in relation to uh, the MK programs, but also the idea of getting people to overcome the moral compunctions that they might have, right, to these kinds of activities. And if you're in the military, you want to train perfect killers, obviously. So how do we do that? How do we train the moral, uh, the, the perfect killer that doesn't have moral qualms and what are all the techniques that might be used? And obviously, one of the first things that comes to mind is that we know this existed in Vietnam. It was the Phoenix Program. We've covered this with uh, Dave McGowan's books. We've covered it with uh, the Douglas Valentine book. We, we went through the Phoenix Program. Um, and that's why uh, Dave was motivated to write Program to Kill, right? So everybody's heard of this. These are some of the, you know, the classics tonight. We all know about this one. We've talked about this book too, right? Program to Kill, where we get Dave McGowan talking about not just the Phoenix program, but how many of the uh, eight, 70s and 80s serial killers came back typically from some form of military training, some form of Vietnam era training, and perhaps mind control programs, et cetera, et cetera. So there seems to be a connection there. Um, and I think that, you know, whatever Ludlum knew, to some degree, he knew about this, right? And it's very plausible, too, because remember that two of the most famous MK Ultra books that are, you know, the, the canon when it comes to MK Ultra that we have covered. You have a Bowert's book, Operation Mind Control, that came out in 1978, I think. Yeah, 78. And then uh, the one that's, uh, very similar to Bowert's book, which is the John Marks text, text uh, on CIA mind control and the Manchurian Candidate. All right, so those are the classics. And this, the John Marks book came out in um, 1980. So two years after the Bowert book, right, you've got these two seminal texts on MK. And Dave's book, this was like 2002, so not too long after the Big Nine event. So one of the things that we have to discuss is the theory, and I don't know for sure if there's a document that proves this, it's just kind of a prevailing theory, is the idea of the Delta. And I think this comes from the idea of Delta Force, right? So Delta Force, obviously special operations, guys that are trained to go in and do, you know, crazy stuff. Extraction missions, sabotage, uh, assassination, right? So we know, for example, in uh, Vietnam, a lot of Green Berets are recruited into being taught how to be these kind of assassins, All right? And so you get people recruited into Delta Force, and everybody knows about Navy SEALs, right? Similar types of things. So the idea here is that um, there's a specific Greek letter coding, as the theory goes, behind the various types of programmed individuals again theory but probably isn't a document somewhere i just don't know exactly what the source document is because most of this comes from journalists and people writing many years later and and people going from other people's testimonies right so again still uh somewhat in the in the realm of theory but Uh, As one of the classic writers on this topic, I'm sure everybody's heard of Jim Keith. This is one of the classics. This is the first book I ever read on this topic many, many years ago is Jim Keith's book, Mass Control, Engineering Human Consciousness. And I'm not advocating everything that Jim Keith ever said. He was an odd character, but Jim Keith wrote this in 1999. And uh, later on, he actually makes a connection that is going to be familiar to you guys because we just covered this. He says, And he's citing from various uh, psychiatrists, 
uh, Hammond is one. Quarter, Quarteron, Quartal, Ham, Quarteron Hammond, I think is his name. Dr. Hammond, whose theory uh, and analysis based on a lot of uh, people that he treated is that there seems to be a connection between the types of people that are that were in this program and the listing of the names in Brave New World. Now, it doesn't match up exactly, but just as we saw in Brave New World, you had alphas, betas, gammas, deltas, and epsilons. There's a, a similar pattern with the structure of those that are that were involved in the various programs to create different types of people. So the theory runs this, that the first level is alpha, that is general mind control, or the base level of programming in the subject characterized by augmented memory and perhaps the splitting of the mind between the left and the right or uh, other types of creating of alters, right? Beta programming. This relates perhaps to SEX operations as in uh, beta uh, SEX kittens or the idea of uh, SEX operatives. <laughs> then we got gamma, which is the level provided uh, mind control involving deception, misdirection, and subterfuge delta being the assassin type of program and so then it goes on to other theoretical levels which may or may not exist and then he talks about some other doctors that are written on this uh, in terms of mind control so again theory but it would seem logical given that delta force does seem to engage in this and so the connection at least loosely seems to be the case and if you remember i didn't notice this until the last time i watched bond the, the no time to die this actually is referenced, the Greek letters are referenced in No Time to Die. In fact, at the end, they give uh, the black chick and uh, Daniel Craig, they're, notif they're picked out by Psy and Phi, right? And in No Time to Die, there's multiple references to various Greek letters. <laughs> and my guess would be that it's referring to this. So... Although I don't know if the novels themselves list Jason Bourne as a Delta. Everything that's in the storyline is basically that. And you are correct, whoever made the comment uh, a few comments back. I have not watched these since the 2000s. So I wasn't sure what to expect. I thought, you know, I've learned and read tons more than I knew in 2000. Uh, two, five, seven, and 12 when these came out. So surely I'm going to see and notice a lot more. And of course, absolutely. 100% it turns out this is absolutely a, a storyline about MKUltra, Delta Assassins, and the notion of creating altars and creating uh, distinct personalities with missions. And it even ties into elements that you wouldn't expect that we're going to get into tonight, like the Russian geopolitical situation. I suspect that when he wrote, or when the second one came out, which was 2005, Born Supremacy, did you notice that that dealt with certain Russian oligarchs? And that the CIA had made alliances with certain Russian oligarchs because they were getting scared due to this program leaking. In the storyline, I'm saying. And that matches up really closely to the time period when uh, Putin was booting certain oligarchs from Russia, who then went to the UK. So it's just very curious that, again, as you're watching these, upon reflection, it's like, hey, that's like that that happened at that time. Hey, this is like that thing. This is like that. Even to the point when we get a Guardian journalist, and by the way, in the 2000s, the, the Guardian actually was doing pretty good journalism, right? We have some friends that wrote for the Guardian back at that time. This is before, you know, the last, uh, you know, 10 years or so when the Guardian went, like, completely. Now, I'm not saying that I agree with everything the Guardian ever wrote in terms of their life, but I'm saying, like, when, they, when the Guardian would cover stuff like uh, Snowden, WikiLeaks, uh, you know, spy stuff. Like they were typically pretty good back at that time. And they were, you know, they were critiquing uh, W and all the warmongering and all that kind of stuff. Which again, you could do in Hollywood at that time. So let's get into Born Identity. We'll be here all night. We've been rambling all night. I can't ramble all night. By the way, if you want to support the show, do so via the Super Chat function. Thank you guys. I already see a couple Super Chats there. I missed one from 
last uh, show, somebody sent a big old fat one of 60 bucks. So thank you, Lori. I'll cover that here in a minute. But the first thing we notice, obvious classic conspiracy tropes here for mind control films. He's a soggy super soldier with a chip implant. No, here we go. The whole thing kicks off with this. And right away, there's amnesia. So, uh uh-oh, he's been under some sort of mind wipe program. And uh, there's a curious detail they threw in there. I don't know who this is supposed to refer to. It could be to, you know, some of these uh, African dictators that had alliances with the CIA, but... they threw in this this character who's an African warlord who's going to write a book about the CIA. And he's heard about Bourne, and his book is going to expose Operation Treadstone. And what is Operation Treadstone? Well, it is precisely this super soldier assassin program, this Delta program. By the way, did you notice this odd, the odd little detail they threw in there that when... Uh, when Matt Dadbod gets back to uh, his apartment, he figures out wh- where he's living at, and he's got all—he's got nothing in there but basically a stack of passports. Shocker! Every spy movie ever, right? You got twenty passports. Did you notice the name of them was one of them was Michael Caine? <laughs> one of the passports, his alternate identity is John Michael Caine. That's that's the that's the Matt Dadbod the airplane, John Michael Caine. Please don't try and do a John a Michael Caine accent. What is wrong with my Michael Caine accent? There's nothing wrong with that, Master Wine. That's that's an excellent, older, older era, Michael Caine. The younger Michael Caine is not as good, but you know that that's not a bad Michael Caine. And if you if you don't agree that that's a great Michael Caine, I will never talk to you again. So, uh, shocker. CIA finds out, uh uh-oh, he's loose. Uh, We don't want Operation Treadstone exposed because it turns out if Jason Bourne remembers his rememberies, right? If he eats some member berries, and he remembers who he is, that he's actually David Webb, then, uh uh-oh, it's all all gone. The whole thing's exposed, and we can't let this African warlord, like a... uh, uh, I just went blank on um, the African warlord that the CIA had, uh, like the most famous one that the CIA had uh, alliance with. What what is that guy's name? Time Magazine actually used to have an article. Yeah, this guy. Charles Taylor. Okay, Charles Taylor was a CIA african warlord by the way remember all the coney stuff coney 2012 what a bunch of balloons that was all fake fake and gray uh but time magazine used to have a a great article uh about for many many years ago about uh cia dictators and they had a few of these african warlords on there but I can't remember who all they were. And isn't it, isn't it wild how Google, like the search doesn't even work anymore? Like you can't find anything anymore. Anyway, some of these warlords, obviously they they had to make this alliance. Well, in this movie, so I don't know which, who he's supposed to be, right? Who he's supposed to represent. But by the way, if you want to vote in 2024 election, vote for uh, Joseph Coney. Coney 2024, is my, that's, what, that's my recommendation. Um, yeah, he did have the Obama campaign art. All right, so they're worried Operation Treadstone is going to be uh, exposed. Now, the next interesting detail is that immediately the CIA is able to activate assassins in all these various cities. So it's like, okay, is Jason Bourne going to Paris, France? Is he going to Spain? Is he going? We got it. We got men, right? We got dudes. Right away, just send a text message on an old flip phone. Right, all the hitmen are the hitmen are sitting around watching cartoons, just waiting for that on the on their flip phone, waiting for that uh, ringtone. Remember the, the 2002 era ringtones, 
and uh, you know you got Dr. Dre and Snoop on your ringtone in 2002. Uh oh, CIA calling. I'm activated. Time to turn off. Time to turn off cartoons. I gotta go kill Mad Dad Bod. Right. That's that's how it works in movies. Literally in movies, hitmen just sitting around watching cartoons. That's it. And then you get a text mo. You get a text on your flip phone. Activated. So literally, they activate like six hitmen, and I totally forgot that uh, Clive Owen is like the main hitman in this one, right? He's the foil to uh, to Jason Bourne. Um, and then, by the way, did you notice the warlord in this? The first thing I think of when I see this warlord is, "Why are you gay?" <laughs> He's that dude, right? Why are you gay? I am gay. You are gay. Right, that's this warlord. Clive Owen, boom, takes out the warlord. Then he's he, then he's got a sight set on uh, Jason Bourne. So half of the movie is basically hitmen after Jason Bourne. By the way, it is a pretty good movie. It holds up. Uh, it holds up, right? This is a little different, though, because James Bond, basically, he just... Car chases, uh, assassin fighting, and seducing women. That's basically all he does. But they added a lot of uh, MacGyver, Matt Giver, right, to to Bourne. So Bourne is over there, you know, putting chewing gum and uh, string, and, you know, he's making bombs with anything. And it continues all the way into the last one where he's like, where you got Jeremy Renner is like creating passports, you know, in a bathroom with toilet paper and cellophane. I mean, how's he doing this? He, he, he does it, right? I'm trying to... Jamie's got such good uh, penmanship that it's so legible that I can't read it because I'm so used to trying to decode my poor penmanship. <clears throat> um... Jamie has an interesting point. She said, did you notice that the sun never shines throughout the entire movie until he reunites with, uh, I guess she means Franca Potente. And this is with that era too. Remember Run Lola Run? And remember that was like her breakout role, uh, which was actually kind of an art film. That was Tom Tykver's early, I think that was his first or second film. So that made Tom Tykver famous. Tykver does a bunch of things that are hits in Hollywood. Not everything, but a few things. And then he did Babylon Berlin. So interesting connections there for uh, the career of Franca Potente, who then goes from Run Little Run and plays the same kind of rave chick in this. So she's got like dyed red rave chick hair, as apparently every chick especially European girls, right? From like 1997 to 2003, they all look like Jennifer Garner and Alias, right? They all got rave, uh, you know, rave chick. So Matt Dadbod, uh, he's on the run with her. He's like hooks up with her. Oh yeah, she'll be my chick. Let's run away. Uh, she can help me out. Um, She gets involved in all this and then they hear about this other thing called the Black Briar Program. And we don't know what Black Briar is yet, but the film ends basically with them running off, as is always the case. You run to Shell Beach. They think they've gotten away. And no, turns out, uh, how do we end it? With that same old freaking Moby song. I didn't even remember that it was a Moby song in this. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Then it fell apart. It fell apart. Oh, baby. <laughs> I didn't even remember. I've totally forgot this song. By the way, I loved Moby in the 90s. I was a huge Moby fan. Right? And this is before Moby acted all just insufferable. At least publicly. Because, you know, in the 90s, you just buy CDs. You don't know everybody's personal activism opinions. And then by the 2000s, then it goes, oh, everybody's an activist. Every, every artist is some activist for some stupid cause. Which is annoying. But it ends with the Moby song, which I totally forgot. <clears throat> then, <clears throat> uh, 
Fast forward a few years later, 2005. This is where we get into the weird Russian element. Now, here's where I was surprised because I would have thought reviewing this film that, oh, here we go, a spy movie. Russians are the bad guys and the CIA are the good guys and they're going to save us from the evil Russians. That's always the narrative. Actually, no. It's a little more complex than that. So I was surprised, again, at the level of nuance that I guess Ludlum allowed in uh, the story or wanted in the story and that, that somehow made it into the movie because throughout the film, <clears throat> it's not really uh, big government daddy, uncle Sam and the CIA. They're the good guys. So that's very, that's rare, right? It's, it's, it's more rare uh, as we get up towards later because by the 2010s, right? When we start getting uh, Chris Kyle movie, when we get, uh, Zero Dark Thirty, when we get Argo, the movies are basically just, just total propaganda. But this series was actually critical, which is surprising. And so you th- you're watching, you think, okay, here we go, Russian bad, they're all Russian bad guys, and they're going to be trying to kill Matt Damon. Now, actually, uh, the there is one Russian assassin who is the Rohan horse lord dude if you remember him from um, Lord of the Rings he plays Kirill the Russian assassin <clears throat> and there's this complex plot where uh, Kirill is working with a Russian oligarch and they are stealing money with a CIA guy from this program so they've actually stolen I don't know 20 30 million dollars from the CIA and it relates to the funding of this Treadstone uh, Blackbriar program so, as we said, uh, Kirill is an FSB, Russian intelligence operative, who works for the Russian oligarch Yuri Gretkov, which is just made up. But, again, very odd timing because right around this time is when Putin, late 90s, early 2000s, Putin actually did boot out certain oligarchs. So, there really was this kind of power play. And the, the, some of these Russian oligarchs were allying with Western intelligence at this time. So, it's odd that this was loosely kind of hinted at in the movie. I didn't expect any of that to be there. So we have this Russian politician uh, in the storyline, Vladimir Nesky, who was about to identify the thief behind uh, this stealing from the CIA uh, program. And turns out, what do you know, old Matt Dadbod is who they sent to take this guy out. So uh, amazingly, the, the Russians are not the bad guys in this overall. And rather, there's certain networks within the CIA that align themselves with uh, this Russian oligarch. And we find out that, no, Matt Dadbod was actually named David Webb. He was just some dude. And in the novel, which I've not read all these. I read one Robert Ludlum uh, story many years ago. I was on a long trip, actually. I put it on audio. And that that had to do with, that one seemed like propaganda. I don't remember the name of it, but it didn't seem uh, very revelatory. But in this one... In the novel, I was reading that this this is the crazy part. David Webb is actually just some shitty dude, right? That they brought into the program, so it's like a La Femme Nikita type of story. Let's just take a, 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 a you know shitty dude off of the street and put him in the program, and guess what? Turns out, <clears throat> in uh, the Jeremy Renner installment. I was surprised at this. It turns out Jeremy Renner is is a a slow boy. I was like, "What? They're taking slow boys and putting them in the dang MK Ultra program? What? What's? What are we going to have next? Corky? No, the Corky program. You can't have Corky out there taking people out, sniping people, giggling back there with the after he's sniping, popping heads, right? Corky's over there giggling. That doesn't seem right." And yet, right, what, is, what does uh, Jeremy Renner say? Oh, uh, I couldn't even get into the military, right? I was trying to get in the Army, and my IQ was too. How you got 12 points below to get in the Army? Bro, how did you put your pants on, dude? <laughs> right? And then he's like, I am part of Treadstone 2.0. Now, wait till we get to Treadstone 2.0, because that's going to blow your mind. I'm talking about the 2012 Jeremy Renner installment. 
So anyway, there's not a whole lot in the 2005 one, except that you did have a uh, nuance with all of this and get this. It actually does refer in this one that one of the code names for David Webb was Delta. So it is Delta program. Interesting. So it's assassin program. And on top of that, there's also something mentioned in the third or fourth one that I didn't expect. Actually, in the screenplay, right? Because we watch these oftentimes, right, with, uh, you know, the subtitles on. So it's like you get a better insight into what's actually usually in the screenplay. Sometimes the subtitles are a little different, but mostly it's right. So Jason Bourne, we found out, is actually a killer with a long history of criminal activities. This is exactly what we covered in La Femme Nikita. And this is actually partly true, too, because there have been programs where they recruited criminals for these kinds of activities. For example, uh, there is the Navy program that we covered in the serial killer stuff, the Thomas Nerritt Navy program about, yeah, recruiting serial killers. I can't find my serial killer notes. They seem to have disappeared, but uh, yeah. Anyway. That uh, is one of the pieces of data that, of course, Dave McGowan mentions in Program to Kill. So it turns out, as we suspected, uh, Jason Bourne was codenamed Delta. He was a trained assassin. He was a criminal brought into this project, just like the plot of La Femme Nikita, which we've done a whole podcast on. Go go listen to our La Femme Nikita podcast we did with uh, PSYOP Cinema, our buddies over there. Um, so the CIA kills Jason Bourne's dad in Beirut, we find out, with a fake flag bomb attack. So it actually says a, with a fake flag bomb attack. I wrote that down. That was my notes. So I think I mean, I think I mean by that note that they actually mentioned a fake flag attempt, bomb, bombing attempt. That's crazy. So this is starting to piss off Bourne, right? Because he's like, wait a minute, you guys fake flag bomb my dad and then you guys put me in this program and uh gave me a new identity not by me adopting it but like you mind controlled me to have a new identity as jason born the super assassin uh, the super soldier assassin killer and you wiped my memory of david webb whoa so we're getting into total right alternate personality trauma-based mind control all right, as we move to Jason Bourne 3, I want to remind you guys also to like and share and uh, let me know in the comments here in the chat uh, what you think I'm missing, if I've missed any details. Somebody said uh, Blackfriar program. Uh, it seemed like that was a joint DOD communication program in this story. So somebody said that's Iran-Contra. Um, I'm not sure if it's Iran-Contra. I don't know what you mean by that. But if you guys do want to... Uh, no, by fake blew up, I don't mean that they faked uh, the the explosion. The explosion was real, but it killed Bourne's dad, but it was blamed on someone else as a fake flag. That's what I'm trying to say. I think that's what was implied in the plot. That's, that's what I got out of it. Uh, if you want to support the show, by the way, do so via the super chat function. That is via Streamlabs. So if you want to ask me a question, or if you want to uh, request me to tell you some more of the books that um, relate to this topic, I got more in my stack over here. We'll get to those in a minute. Do so via Streamlabs. So Super Chats are via Streamlabs. Thank you guys so much. Now, 2007, things are getting a little more interesting. And one element that you don't pick up on until you go back and watch those. Oh, that's an interesting point. In this movie, right, Jason Bourne is David Webb in real life. But... Jeremy Renner plays Gary Webb, who actually was taken out in the movie about Gary Webb. Exactly. That is interesting. And I think right, the messenger, that messenger, that's Oliver Stone, right? I think so. All right. So born three, guess what the focus here is. Now the focus is, uh, NSA spying. Now I knew about, uh, when did I learn about the NSA? Probably, 2002 right after the big nine event 
I started learning a lot of this stuff and, and I knew about conspiracy stuff in 98, right? Cause I'd read about the United Nations and socialism and John Birch level stuff. And then after the big nine event that woke a lot of people up too at that time. That's a lot of people were saying, Hey, wait a minute. This is this weird about this. And then there was, uh, various information coming out through the 2000s from James Bamford. And Bamford wrote the first book on uh, NSA in 1982, Puzzle Palace. And then he wrote other books that came out in the 2000s, uh, like the one that talks about the 9-11 hijack men, that they had been tracked and traced and followed the entire time. So this idea that we had no idea is totally nonsense, given the fact that the NSA have been watching these guys. And didn't it just come out yesterday? That, oh yes, it turns out that they were actually uh, CIA guys, mainstream news. Whoa, uh, you mean what we knew t- for 20 years? Come on, dude. Come on, bro. If you guys would, hit like and share. Help me out here, come on. Um, I was about to look some up and I forgot what it was. Anyway, oh, the let's see, when do we first get... Uh, WikiLeaks dumps, right? This is when we first start hearing about this stuff. Um, 20, right around this time. Right around this, 2010. Yeah. Because I was following it closely at the time, and WikiLeaks was, at that time, sending stuff to Guardian, Thus, I mean, other things too, like their Spiegel and, but Guardian was also very interested in WikiLeaks <clears throat> back in the 2010 period. And there was the cables that were leaked. You remember that? The, the diplomatic cables leak that was supposed to be a big deal in 2010. <clears throat> I mean, I'm not saying that WikiLeaks didn't leak good stuff at times, but a lot of the stuff too, wasn't that, that, uh, earth shattering, I guess we're saying. But I do think that over time, I did gain more respect for uh, for Julian Assange. I, I, I think that he was generally trying to leak stuff eventually. And then not too long after that, we get Snowden. And so that's going to be around the time period of the 2012 uh, thing. And Snowden tells us about PRISM, right? Snowden leaks, that's around 2012, 13, 14. I'm trying to remember the exact date. But a lot of that also, I think, was in The Guardian, wasn't it? Early on. Because I was... <clears throat> maybe Snowden leaks for 2014. But I was following Alex and all that, you know, since 2003. So I was watching all of this in real time and following... I remember when Alex had uh, Brigitte jones Dutier, right? Who was working with Assange at the, right, right at the beginning. And Alex had Brigitte jones Dutier on. And they were, they were doing interviews about WikiLeaks at that time. So, I mean, I've been following this stuff since WikiLeaks was first there. But that is very much, those types of stories are very much what underlies Born 3. Which is odd because, again, this is 2007. So 2007, Born 3 is very close to Snowden stuff and Assange stuff. But when... In the movie at the beginning, somebody mentions the term Operation Blackbriar. The keyword search at the NSA is triggered, and they know, hey, let's check out who's talking about this this program. Now, that's not anything revelatory, right? Even though I think Prism uh, from Snowden did talk about that. But actually, in Bamford's Puzzle Palace from 1982, he talks about keyword search technology in the 80s. So the NSA had keyword search technology in the 80s right but even though that already existed in 2007 in the movie they're showing you that hey wait a minute if there's keyword search then why weren't the big nine event guys caught earlier yeah exactly that's a great question and it's a question that even james bamford himself asked in his book on the nsa is is a 2000s era book on the nsa uh, which I read. What is that book? I always forget this one. There's two different ones. Well, I mean, he's written a bunch of books, but I'm saying um, it's not Body of Secrets. That was 2001. Shadow Factory, that's it. 
Shadow Factory is one year after Born 3. So there you go. And that is about, hey, wait a minute. Wh- wh- where was the NSA with all the big nine guys? that We know they, they knew everything about them. So what the heck? Well, it starts to get more interesting in Born 3 because not only do we have the Snowden uh, 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 Prism program, WikiLeaks-style stuff going on, and the mentioning of Echelon. By the way, Echelon is real. So Echelon is a real program, and it was Echelon, if I recall, that Bamford mentions had actually triggered and listened to, uh, you know, like Muhammad Atta, these guys. Also at this time, which you guys will forget about unless you were paying attention to all this stuff. Do you guys remember how often people talked about rendition? This was a huge thing. And uh, who was that Bush era guy? Was it John Yu? Not John Woo. It would have been better if it was John Woo because then we would have had some action and we would have had Tom Coombe and John Van Dam jumping up on motorcycles and doing flips. No, no, John Woo... John Yu, right? He was the Bush era guy that argued for why we got to have T O R T U R E. This is a huge debate in the 2000s. So all these movies started coming out, right? There's even a movie with the uh, one of the films with the uh, Donnie Darko, Jake Gyllenhaal, right? He's in one of these movies where they're questioning the rendition programs because it comes it comes out. Oh, hey, Uncle Sam's got all these rendition programs. And then it, then it's a debate about well, but is waterboarding actually t-o-r-t-u-r-e right remember all this do you guys remember the 2000s this is a huge deal there was all these debates and all these news stories then it comes out about guantanamo bay remember that so that's the atmosphere and the zeitgeist of 2005 6 7 era born stuff and that's in the movie they actually discussed the waterboarding i think at one point in this movie Anyway, I'm trying to remember when did did all the Guantanamo stuff come out? What year was that? 2000. I'm talking about in the news. I'm not talking about when did it exist. Anyway, it's in this time period, right? For me, everything in the 2000s kind of runs together, right? It's just kind of all like a generic... Oh yeah, that's roughly in the 2000s. I don't have a very good memory like chronologically. I just remember like loose periods, you, see, you know. Anyway, <clears throat> that's all in the background of this movie and I thought that was interesting. And then we 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 find out that <clears throat> what is Blackbriar? Well, it's more than just an upgrade uh for surveillance. Bra- Blackbriar is a treadstone upgrade. Uh-oh, we got a treadstone 2.0 in the works. And in this one, the Guardian journalist guy is getting information from a CIA station chief in Madrid, I think. And he says, hey, I want to leak everything about Treadstone and Treadstone 2.0. So he goes to this Guardian journalist. And it's in the movie. It's the Guardian. That's pretty crazy, right? And so Jason Bourne reads this uh, Guardian guy's story about himself, about Matt Dadbod and Franco Patente getting killed. And so he said, oh, i got to meet with this guy. So he tries to meet with the journalist to give him information, but the CIA is tracking him and all this. So they activate assassins to take out the Guardian journalist, which is pretty wild. Again, this harkens to like David Webb, t- or, uh, Gary Webb type stuff. Exactly. Then we find out more about, well, so what is uh, Treadstone exactly and what exactly is Blackbriar? Well, as we said, Blackbriar is a Treadstone upgrade. People talking about this super secret program is what triggered the Echelon keyword search to say, hey, people are talking, there's chatter about this. We better close in on them. Then we find out there's this shady character who's running the mind control program named Dr. Hirsch. Wild, because guess what? This is very close to many of the actual doctor. I mean, I don't know of an MK Ultra doctor named Dr. Hirsch, but I'm saying that. The actual MKUltra doctors like Jose Delgado wrote books about their MKUltra operations, like physical control of the mind. So Dr. Hirsch, obviously one of these Sidney Gottlieb, Dr. Ewan Cameron, Dr. Jose Delgado type of characters, right? That's who 
this Dr. Hirsch uh, character is. And we find out that he's a mind control handler doctor. He runs one of uh, the, the Treadstone slash Blackfire program. And he's involved in the umbrella program for black ops, which is to train these Matt dad bots. And turns out, oh, it's not just Matt dad bot. There's a bunch of these. Okay. And there's even, I think, a female one in the, in the next one. So we find out that what he specialized in was behavior modification. It actually says that behavior modification, the Dr. Hirsch guy and the breakdown of the psyche of those that opted into this program. Cause they always do this opt in thing, right? Cause it's, well, it's not my fault. You opted in. And that's the thing that Jason Bourne learns, right? When he finally confronts the guy that runs the program, this Dr. Hirsch. He said, well, uh, sorry, David, uh, not my fault. You opted in. It's like, oh, yeah, but I mean, if you trick somebody into opting into something, you can't, you don't excuse yourself because you tricked them into it, right? So, uh, it turns out, yes, the program is a top secret uh, DARPA type of thing involving the erasing of memory in one's former life as a test subject to see if they could create a perfect assassin. And it's not just the classic M. Kiltra stuff. Now, as we see in the next installment, it evolves into bio enhancement, bio med tech, transhumanism, nanotech, and changing the genome. So it gets even wilder, which, by the way, was the plot and part of No Time to Die, which we just mentioned. I'm uh, looking to see if there's anything else in the... Oh, another curious element was that it does show Matt Dadbod's dog tags. And a curious element, they show his religion as Catholic, <laughs> which I thought was curious because um, you know a lot of the CIA people during this period were actually Roman Catholic dudes. Uh, during the, the, for example, Phoenix program, William Colby, famous trad cat, Latin mass uh, uh, attender the guy who set up essentially the relationship between the CIA and the Vatican bank through uh, Pius the 12th. That's William Colby. Um, we got other, uh, William Casey also a uh, trad cat. We got, uh, Alexander Haig, right? Roman Catholic. So a lot of uh, people in the Reagan era. So you might be onto something with an Iran Contra thing. A lot of, a lot of Roman Catholics, a lot of trad cats uh, involved in this, but just curious that Matt Damon was the David Webb is, uh, said to be a Catholic on his dog tags. Um, and as we know, yes, his mind control given alternate identity. It is a, uh, trauma based mind control, alternate personality creating program. And guess how it ends. You got it. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Then it fell apart. It fell apart. I didn't, I just like Moby ends. Every one of these did not remember this. Did you remember that? I don't remember any of that. Thank you so much for those super chats. We got one last one, which is where it gets really crazy with the transhumanist elements, as I mentioned. Final one is Born Legacy 2012. A lot of people didn't like this movie. Uh, I thought as a movie, it's pretty good. Again, all of these are actually pretty good because they're pretty critical of these programs, this whole uh, attitude, uh, the whole project. And then the fourth one, being a transhumanism i didn't cover the the fifth one with matt where matt dad bod comes back that one kind of put me to sleep i think that one is just him and julia styles and i don't know what they're doing they're running on rooftops and crashing motorcycles like they always do how many times can we how many times can we run across a rooftop right like every spy movie's got and jamie was saying and also if you have a fruit stand it's done like if you're if you're in a if you see a spy coming you got a fruit stand pack it up because that shit is demolished. I guarantee you, right? Uh, Born Legacy, 2012, Jimmy Renner. Now, this one is about, as we said, nanotech, right? We find out special operations training has Jeremy Renner dropped off in the middle of Alaska. Uh, we don't know why. What He's just dropped off. He's got to survive. So he's he's been trained with survival skills, all this kind of stuff. And then we flash to uh, new villains. Uh, this time around, it's uh, it's not the NCIS dude or whatever his name is. Now it's it's uh, Edward Norton. So Edward Norton's the new kind of 
pencil neck CIA bureaucrat guy. And they decide together with the head of the CIA that it's time to uh, put an end to Treadstone, the whole project, because it's about to come out. Because the uh, lean-in girl boss CIA woman from the first three, the uh, Landry operative, she's about to go public and she's going to testify and she's got all the documents. So uh, time to shut down Treadstone and that means we're going to get rid of all of them. In other words, the assassins have to die. Guess what the focus of this one is? Drone warfare. Wow. So it switches from uh, surveillance and the hot topics of the two th- late 2000s. Now it's all drone warfare, right? Remember Obama? All the warfare was, uh, we're going to, I'll send a drone every wedding. Every wedding in the Middle East. Uh, my wife, Michael. Uh, no, I'm just joking. Uh, special operations training in, 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 in Alaska. He meets up with Oscar Isaac, another person in the program. But again, Jeremy Renner has had his mind wiped. So he's like, well, yeah, I know how to kill and like string up a wolf and like, you know, wrestle a wolf to the ground. But I don't know how to, uh, you know, I don't know where I'm at or what's going on. <laughs> so he doesn't know if Oscar Isaac's going to kill him. Just two dudes in a mind control assassin project stuck out in the woods. We think they're going to fight. We don't know what's going on. And we find out, hey, wait a minute. It's time for them all to be crushed and taken out. And so they send a drone that sends a missile. So a drone blows up the cabin intended on killing Jeremy Renner, who is uh, Operation Treadstone 2.0. He's one of the, and what is 2.0? Nanotech super soldiers. Genome enhanced super soldiers. But they've been tweaked in a unique way to control them which is that they now have a chemical need for a drug, which is some weird nanotech drug that the government has cooked up. Now, this reminded me, for all you X-Fan files out there, you guys remember the X-Files where Krychek injects Skinner with nanotech, and he's got like a remote control where he can like bop, torture him with it. Bop, bop, right? Remember that? This is basically that. And so Jeremy Renner is a, he has to take some pill, which is some sort of nanotech nootropic pill, because we find out, as I said with this other weird old movie, he's actually a slow boy. He actually, if he doesn't take his smart pill, he were, he, he becomes Jeremy Retarder, right? Not Jeremy Renner, Jeremy Retarder. He turns back into slow boy. And um, what was that movie? Is it Charlie? Remember that? Is that the movie where they take that dude and uh, they take a slow boy and make him smart? Yes. If you've never seen the 1968 movie Charlie, <laughs> and is that Flowers for Algernon? I don't even know all the. I don't remember all these. Right. So Charlie, go watch this crazy movie. Because I'm like, this is Charlie, dude. But now that I think about it, actually, Charlie is probably uh, like hinting at some kind of MKUltra program. And it looks like, is it free on YouTube? I don't know. Let's see if this is free. Can you watch it? It looks like it is. So yeah, so if you want to watch Charlie, you see what I mean? It's actually free on YouTube right here. And the funny thing is that in, in Charlie, like, you know, when, when they, he goes in this project and it's like limitless, exactly. He, he gets super smart. Then he gets too smart. Then he turns into this cool dude who invents super weapons and rides around on a, mo- a motorcycle and just like sleeps with chicks, right? That's what happens to Charlie. And then Charlie re- reverts to being a slow boy. Okay, but Charlie might be based on Flowers for Algernon, but I know that the movie I'm talking about is Charlie because here is the actual movie. I'll put it in the chat for you right here. Oh, yeah. Remember John Travolta, Limitless? <laughs> that movie was so stupid. I forgot about uh, uh, Phenomena with John Travolta, right? Anyway. So, Jeremy Renner is, uh, had his genome altered. And the craziest part is where Rachel Weiss, who's the science woman, right? Boss lady, science girl. Shout out. Shout out to my boss lady. Leaning in science girls. Science girls rule the world. 
she goes into this wild story about yes uh shout out to patristic faith we have actually covered lawnmower man we had a blast covering lawnmower man because it has a slow boy who turns into a smart boy in fact he turns into a demon god boy right better to be a slow boy than to be an intelligent demon god in the in the metaverse right that's that's what happens in lawnmower man we have fun by the way covering lawnmower man that's a classic it, it, mods if you would by the way see if you guys can find when we covered lawnmower man um what was going on with edward norton i'm trying to remember oh oh no so rachel vice gives this explanation for how this program works i didn't i didn't even get it but it, it was like this sounds like the coup or something right like it sounds like what they were doing at wuhan <laughs> when she starts explaining what they do at their lab i'm not joking and then turns out they're gonna get rid of her and this was a crazy part which i probably can't really say too much about but one of the scientists in the lab, it turns out in this installment, is wound up and mind controlled to go on a S H O O T I N G spree in the science lab, taking out all the scientists because that's they're shutting down everything to do with the Treadstone Project. So that means getting rid of all the people involved in it, including Rachel Weiss. Anyway, Jeremy Renner is there at Rachel Vice's house. Great timing. He just happens to show up when she's going to be killed. And kills all the bad guys, saves her, and he, I need my fix, right? He needs his happy pills. He needs his nootropic nanotech super soldier assassin pills. Well, she doesn't have any. Where are they at? They're in Manila. <laughs> what? Yes. Let's fly to Manila. Fly to Asian countries where they got labs where they're doing bioweapons. Interesting exactly he went postal right that was a 90s thing science beta soy science man goes postal and they actually explained that he was wound up and triggered to do that that was crazy anyway long story short uh turns out one of the key government figures uh running this project i don't remember the actor's name but he clearly he's a cheney-esque character i thought that was interesting so they have a guy who literally looks like cheney with the CIA head running the Treadstone project and shout out to our girl bosses out there, right? Former operative Landry, who's going to expose this. It's going to be just get the word out, right? Cause that's how it works. You get the word out and then it all cr cr crashes down and crumbles. Is that really how it works? Um, The virus. I'm trying to understand the logic of this so-called virus technology, right? In the story, somehow Renner had been given some genetic altering virus, and that turned him into the 2.0 Jason Bourne 2.0. And she actually explains that where they were doing these operations. This is in the screenplay. Is at Fort Detrick. That's crazy because Fort Detrick is where they continue. MK Ultra, according to John Marks in his old classic book. So clearly, uh, Robert Ludlum has read this book because he's including obscure details in that book in this story. The uh, whatever virus or whatever nanotech thing that Renner has been given has made his abilities to be permanent. However, if he undoes this i guess we're supposed to think he would revert back to being a slow slow boy i don't know but she says it's genomic targeting so the stabby targets the genome and can turn you into a you know ben affleck in the accountant right super spurg assassin like we covered in that movie Right, or presumably it can do all kinds of other things. And so this one, uh, the only criticism I have of that installment is that it ends super abruptly for no reason with uh, them running away and they're floating on a Filipino barge and they're just like eating lunch. They're, I don't know, eating noodles or something. And it's like, that's it. Well, so is Treadstone ended? or like? So I guess we're supposed to think there's going to be another one. And there was another one. 
which was not very good. I fell asleep in that one. So I'm sorry, Matt and Dad, boy, but I fell asleep in your movie. I don't know what else to tell you. So there we go. All the elements that we would expect and much more. I didn't expect the nuances with the genome stuff. I didn't expect the nuances with the second installment and all the Russian uh, angles with the Russian oligarchs. That was all pretty much based in reality as far as I could tell. Uh, let's see a couple other books. If you're looking for an introductory book um, that's n- newer than the two, Bowart, uh, th- this one's okay. It's an it's a kind of a written as a really a, a pop introductory level to these topics. We just covered, as you guys know, Brave New World, which is obviously more and more talking about the top the, these topics than I ever realized. Right? We just broke this down uh, a full chapter by chapter breakdown with uh, quite frankly. Uh, it, which is on my channel for subscribers. So check that out. And yeah, absolutely. It's, this is 100% about M. Keltra. There's another famous text too by uh, intelligence writer Gordon Thomas. He's written many in- intelligence-based texts. His book is Journey into Madness. Uh, that's a well-known one. And then there's another one called uh, Monarch, the New Phoenix Program. Um, that one's okay. So those are some other texts if you're looking for introductory topics to this this one is is really good but it's hard to find uh, you can never get it it's always out of print because it's you know, like 1998 but yeah, there you go there's some other ones too there's also as we said the uh colin ross dr colin ross has a book about the cia, uh, CIA doctors and there is uh, the jose delgado book which eventually we need to cover jose delgado's book i mean this this would be a classic right there right this thing because that's that's a prize right there i bet you can't even get that thing somehow jamie found this copy at an old bookstore somewhere and i I bet you money you can't find that book i don't know but usually these old like this is the same publisher of the salk books right world perspectives they publish the two jonah salks books that i have which nobody can ever find and everybody emails me where can i get those books i don't have the books I have my copy. And then they're like, it's your fault you mention these books and then they go for $5,000 on Amazon. No, books go out of print. It's not my fault. But look, the reality is that if you want to avoid this kind of soy man, bug man mind control, the best way to do it is to utilize the antidote, the kryptonite to the soy man, soyance man mind control and toxic culture, toxic diet is to begin with Chalk.com, baby. Head on over to Chalk.com. Get you some Tong Cataly, which is proven to boost testosterone. Read the peer-reviewed studies over there. I guarantee you're going to be happy. Counteract all of this garbage with Chalk.com. Tong Cataly is 100% Malaysian rainforest source, 100% pure. You're going to love it. You will notice that it does work. Don't take more than one a day. I, I've taken two and I didn't sleep. It was not. It was not fun. So, you know, don't go, don't go crazy. But there's also other options. There's the Irish moss for the ladies. If you want to balance out hormones, Irish moss has a lot of nutrients, a lot of uh, minerals that are uh, missing in our diet. There's also she legit, which is famous for mental focus and clarity. She legit. If you go over to chalk.com right now, use the promo code J 50 C H O Q.com J 50. That's J A Y five zero. You get 50% off right now. 50% off. And if you want to get recurring subscriptions, go ahead and use the promo code J53LIFE. J-A-Y-5-3-L-I-F-E. 53% off all recurring subscriptions. That includes these great products like Chocolate. Chocolate. Get it? Chocolate. Too legit to quit. You're going to want to put that in your morning smoothie, your afternoon after workout smoothie, I promise you. So again, you want to support my stuff, support your, it's a, it's a deal. We got a deal, right? It's a good thing. I help you, you help me, everybody gets helped out. All you got to do is go over there, use the promo code, right? 360 win, as Lord Voldemort says. It's a win over here, it's a win over there. 360 win. By the way. As I said, beginning of the show, next to Lord Voldemort, 
Today was the biggest interview we've ever done. Huge. 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 I mean, we're talking like square lips of Trump. Huge. Could be huge. Really huge. Wonderful huge. Right? Square lip Trump huge level interview today. Most famous person I've ever talked to other than Lord Voldemort today. Crazy. So look for that coming up in two weeks. You want a little hint? You want a hint? Somebody want a hint? Here's your hint. <clears throat> you do a little thing here. We do a little thing there. Everybody's happy. Bada bing, bada boom. Who's that? Who do you think? Who do you think that might be? There's a little hint. Anyway, it was a great interview. Wild conversation. Let's go to the Super Chats. But if you want to support me, you support me by uh, getting the chalk products. And you support yourself. That's the point. That's what I'm trying to say. Where are we at? Thank you guys for these Super Chats. And so much so much thanks to Lori, who uh, threw in a Super Chat at the end of the last live stream. $60. Thank you so much. She says, once again, good stuff. Keep up the good work. Well, you ended up winning that day's uh, Super Chat there because I think you had the biggest one that day. Yes, you did. Thank you so much, Lori. Much appreciated. 60 bucks. Uh, let's see. Next one is... Lost my place. Yukon Cornelius. That's a name right there. $5. Can you review Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Uh, I assume that's a joke. I make a cameo. What? How you make a cameo? It would be an honor to be featured. Uh, are you talking about that old claymation? How you make a, How do you make a can? You joking, dude? I hid Crowleyan Easter eggs. Okay, I think this is a joke, but uh, okay. Turbo Diesel five dollars. Will you be debating the fish tank members with text to speech? <laughs> so Sam Hyde's uh, reality show, I think, has started. Uh, it's called Fish Tank. So check that out. Um, it looks funny. Uh, I don't think I'll be debating those people though, but that that's an interesting idea. Cyril Oppenheimer, ten dollars. I just had chrismation. I was received in orthodoxy. Hey, great to hear that. Shout out to you for being a part of guiding me. Well, much appreciated, Cyril Oppenheimer. Long time super chatter, long time <clears throat> supporter, and glad to hear the good news, man. Constantine Minel trauma, fifteen dollars. I have two questions. How does orthodoxy justify the use of violence? Well, number one, I don't think there is a justification of, hey, we want to be violent. Uh, in canon law, violence is frowned upon, but it's not the orthodox justifying violence. It's that God gives us the right to self-defense. And God gives families and nations the right to self-defense. So you could go read the Russian church's statement on social uh, order. And you can go to Rokor Studies and read the uh, Ro uh, Russian Orthodox Church and War, Christianity and War articles. Uh, what about the case of capital punishment? I mean, Romans 13 says that there should be capital punishment. So I don't know what the, what's the problem there. What do you think about preppers? I think it's a good idea and wise to prep, but I, I don't go crazy with uh, prepper stuff. But I do think it's a wise idea to have storable food to be, you know, living uh, off the grid as sufficient as you can. I don't mean off the grid, like run to the hills and have a shack, become a prospector and run around in brown, nasty underwear with a flap on the back. That's not what I'm talking about. Maybe you want to do that. I don't care. You do go do it, whatever. But, I mean, all my most, a lot of my friends, not most, I don't know how you, many friends are into homesteading. Seems like a wise decision, especially if you have a family, right? But I would definitely be out of blue cities. Uh, but I don't think you got to, you know, live in a shack in the middle of nowhere. J Jesse Morosco, 747. God bless you, Jay. Thank you so much. 747. That's an odd price. 747. JJ, $5. Interesting that they chose Paul Greengrass to later direct United 93. Oh, I remember seeing that propaganda movie. That was terrible. And did Paul Greengrass, did he, uh, which one did he do? 
Did he do multiple, multiple Bourne movies? I didn't even think to look at who was the director. Okay, so Troy, Tony Gilroy, Paul Greengrass, Doug Lyman. Interesting. And did y'all watch the one with Matt Dadbod? Was that a flop? The last one? Let's see what it did. The 2016 one. I watched it and I remember falling asleep. Because like him and Julia Stiles and, and Vincent Cassell. Like when does Vincent Cassell not play a douchebag killer? Like that's the only role he can ever play. Like you want to be a, a killer or you want to be a, a French douchebag? Or a French douchebag killer. That's the only role. Like he's typecast forever as that. Uh, had some big names though. Alicia Vikander from Ex Machina, Tommy Lee Jones. But was it a success? Let's find out. The budget on that one, it was interesting. So it was actually a big hit. It cost 120 million and it made 400 million. So old uh, Matt Dadbod got him a, he got a uh, billion dollar franchise. So what, yeah, so the Bourne franchise is a $1.6 billion franchise. Wow. And uh, old Baffleck got him one too, didn't he? And this one surprised me, but the Ben Affleck Batmans were also a huge. I would have, I thought they were like failures or something, but I didn't realize. No, actually those are like mega he made like five, not he, but they, there's like $500 million made on the first one, I think. Where even is that? I'm trying to find it and I can't. All I want to see is the freaking Ben Affleck Batman. They're pulling up like T-R-A-N-S actors in film. I don't want to see that. That's not what I'm looking for. What the heck? Let's see. Batman versus Superman. Let's try this. One. What did it make? Batman versus Superman Dawn of Justice. That sounds corny. Yeah, dude, check that out. I've never even watched this because I, I thought these, this, these sounded terrible. Are they actually good? I don't even know. Uh, the budget was 250 300 and it made almost a billion. So just the Batman versus Superman with, with old Baffleck almost made a billion dollars that's crazy so you think that the Batflex are the worst Batmans interesting since George Clooney <laughs> uh, is that the one with Edward P. Nigma? no that's Val Kilmer but did, actually if you go back and watch the Jim Carrey Batman I think we covered it that's about TV mind control and everybody do you guys remember that? Because Edward P. Nigma is like a homo homoerotic uh, soy science man who has a crush on Val Kilmer. You don't notice that until you go back and watch it. It's like, what? And then Val Kilmer is like, Val Kilmer's like Elon Musk, like this big tech guru guy, right? And he's like, he just disses Edward P. Nigma, Enigma. And it uh, causes soy rage in. Edward P. Nigma, and so he devises the idea to use signals through the TV to mind control everyone in Gotham, and it works. Interesting, interesting. So go back and watch uh, your old your Val your Val classics. By the way, we we did a uh, Val installment. That was a lot of fun, or I did it. I think it was just me. Jamie went there for that. It was just me. The Val Kilmer special, and I did one of my favorites. The classic, The Saint. That's a classic, one of my favorite movies. So if you didn't see the uh, the Val installment, go watch that. What did we do there? I did Batman, The Saint, and Spartan. And Willow! So that was actually a quadruple feature. I think I added an extra one on there. Uh, hey guys, if you would hit like and share. Remember too, we also have a show sponsor, which is Grand Theft World. Head on over to Rockfin. And not only do you get access to everybody if you subscribe to Rockfin, you get access to the best of everybody. So you can sign up on Rockfin for free and get oodles of free content from everybody. 
But you can also sign up on Rockfin in a paid subscriber content sense and get access to much more from everybody. So basically a flat fee gets you everybody's paid content for what's on Rockfin. Now, there's a lot of my content. I think I'm up to about 70, 60, 70%. I've migrated to Rockfin. But there's also advantages uh, uh, to subscribers to my website. So if you do want to subscribe to my content, you get all of the archives because not everything is on Rockfin because it takes forever because I got so much content. You can subscribe on Rockfin for uh, not just me, but also everybody. Or you can subscribe at jaysanalysis.com and get access to all of my vast archives over the last six years going back. Tons and tons of con uh, content. You get basically a grad school education in a fun way via my archives at jaysanalysis.com for a mere pittance, a mere pittance of $4.95 a month $60 a year. Remember, it is a recurring subscription. Because every now and then somebody says, I didn't know it was a recurring subscription. Why are you taking out money? Because it says recurring subscription. So if you would, subscribe to Jay's Analysis and get that education. Get the education that you need, that you want. Deep down, that's what you want. All right. Thank you guys so much. A lot of fun. That, there we have it, the Bourne movies. I don't think we missed anything with skipping the final Matt Dad Bond installment, even though it was actually, it looks like a big hit. I didn't realize that. But uh, how did it end? Did he end up with Julia Stiles or something? I, I'm, guess, I'm guessing that's what happened. I don't know. But uh, if you guys would hit like and share. Hey, we got uh, good ideas for new installments coming. I'm thinking we haven't done a, a Mel Gibson installment. And there's some classic Mel Gibson conspiracy films. Conspiracy theory. Like the most famous Hollywood conspiracy movie with Mel Gibson. Why have we not? Well, it's in my book. I did cover it in a Stark Hollywood. However, we've not done a podcast on it because there's just something about you got to wait for the right time. You wait for the right time. And then it comes about and then you say, hey, let's do conspiracy theory. Let's do Edge of Darkness. Also a conspiracy movie. Really good Mel Gibson movie. We did do uh, all the Mad Maxes. That was part of our dystopian series. So we've already done all the Mad Maxes. So we're going to find some other Mel Gibsons. Now we might tack on the classics like Braveheart and Apocalypto. Uh, or we might keep it at Conspiracy Mel Gibson. Or we, I, I'm thinking I want to... Jamie had a good idea. Let's just do Apocalypto, Braveheart, Conspiracy Theory, and uh, Edge of Darkness, which is interesting. What do you guys think? Uh, let me know what movies you'd like to see analyzed next below. 